So, uh, Sam, can we take some questions? Yeah. The question that I have is how do we like differentiate? How do we know? Because I, I completely agree that m most people should be out of jail, but how do we know? You know what I mean? Like how do you, you said, know there's what? Some, you said there's some evil that you saw in prison and then there's some not. How do we get, how do we make sure that we're letting out all the knots? Hey, Good. I, can I re interject? He never, he never said most people should be out. Yeah, right. well, you know what I mean? Like, okay, I got you, but nah, I, that's really a percentage, important. A percentage, a percentage. We're not even, I'm not even going to assume that he meant most people. Anybody that comes out, why do we let them out? How do we know? First and foremost, I served 52 years. If they don't know who I am by the time I went out, they would never know. But it doesn't take 50 years to determine by a person's actions, their deeds, word of mouth, by what the, some of the most exhaustive, evaluative, and diagnostic systems in existence exist in prison. They know the good guys from the bad guys. They do. For over 40 plus years, I was an educator. After I began to learn myself and I learned that the best way to learn is to teach someone else. And I started teaching those who I knew didn't know as much as I did about history, about art, about science, about math, about geography, about any and every subject I could get my hands on. You know, that's one of the reasons why I'm working for the Penn State University right now, because I do have those credentials. I have that experience. And I left a track record. I was in organizations, I was in groups, I started organizations and groups. We had, in 1972, we had a consortium of universities and colleges coming into Greater Four offering a degree-oriented program. This is after we brought the GED in, after we started school, basic ABE school, adult basic education. After we did that, we said, what about us getting degrees? What about, if, can't we take this further? Some of us were capable of doing this. I knew I was. And we, when I say we, I mean us inmates, us prisoners, us convicts, we started this. And people throughout the years have seen what we have been able to do. And it's saying, well, Irvin Moore, John Jones, Peter, what's they know. So in answer to your question, of course there will be mistakes every now and then. It's going to be. But for the most part, they know who's who. Um, I know you said, uh, you talked about the whole, and I know that there's a lot of research from psychologists about how, like, the serious psychological toll being in solitary confinement puts on inmates' minds. So I wanted to know, like, what exactly was your experience when you were in the hole? Like, what were you thinking? How was your mental? Stuff like that, at least from when you were in general, general population to when you would be in the hole. Well, the hole. I don't often go back there, but I do. I was lucky, I was blessed, I was young, I was resilient. The amount of time that I spent in the hole wasn't exorbitant. Some of my friends, some people I know have been in the hole. I was in there for 30 days, then I was in there for three months. And then I was in there for six months. I think the longest I was in the hole was six months. Hey, I know Ir people Irvin, that have... There are a lot of students in the class who don't... English is not their first language, or they're okay. not from the U.S. Mm -hmm. Can you explain, again, what the hole is? Oh, okay. In, uh, very, in very basic... Iso isolation. Solitary confinement. As I said initially, if you commit an infraction which could be you took a piece of bread, <laughs> you took a piece of bread from the dining hall, put it in your pocket to take it back to your cell to eat. That's an infraction. You stepped out of line and stepped in front of another person where your buddy was at so you could eat together. That's an infraction. 
Fighting, of course, is a fraction, an infraction. Stealing is an infraction. Kissing your mother or your wife or your girlfriend more than one time in the visiting room is an infraction. That could put you in a hole. That could put you in isolation, solitary confinement. And as I was about to say to the young student, the most time I spent in the hole was about six months. But I know people that have been in the hole for 30 years, nonstop. Listen to what I'm telling you. I know people, I know men who have been in solitary confinement for over 30 years. Now, come on now. Come on. Why? Because they were deemed a threat? Because they talked back incessantly? Because they stood up against what they thought was unjust treatment? But that's the system. And I was lucky, I say, because <clears throat> I was resilient. I had a mind and my imagination carried me everywhere, everywhere. For the first part, as I said, I was in the cell with nothing, not a pencil, not a piece of paper. And I would devise games and scenarios and recite things that I had read or heard. I opened my mind up to understand what the state is like, what the nation is like, what the world is like, what our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy is like, what its closest neighbor, which is 4.2 light years away. Light years traveling at the speed of 186,000 miles every second. And it would take us four and a half years to reach our closest neighbor. Now stuff like that humbles, humbles you. I said, oh my Lord. But it expanded my mind and afforded me the ability to withstand the whole, afforded me the ability to withstand the life sentence that I had on my back that afforded me the ability as a young person to stand what was a possible lifetime of incarceration and the fact that my family was dying all around me. But yes, uh, some people are lucky, some people are blessed, some people are genetically equipped to deal with that gross injustice, but it's been studies done that determined years and years ago the impact of that kind of punishment, man's inhumanity to man, cruel, what they call cruel and unjust punishment. When you got out of prison for the first time ever, uh, what's the first thing that you wanted to do or that you did oh, that really my made you God. happy? You could... There was a commercial that came out 45 plus years ago you know what it is, bro? that when I saw it, a... I just salivated at the mouth. I said, yeah. I got to get some, I got to get that. A, I got a, to. a Big Mac. And what happened when you... <laughs> well, the commercial, first and foremost, was to all beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on the sesame seed bun. To all beef patties, special cheese, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on the sesame seed bun. And I said, I could not wait to get out to get one of those. And, and, and what happened after you took the first well, bite? Well, actually, before I even took the first bite, when I went to... Uh, Went to, went to be interviewed in front of the Board of Pardons and Parole. Some of them asked me, we heard you uh, looking for a Big Mac, Mr. Moore. Because I had been saying this for years. And uh, that's a common question. What are you gonna do when you first get out? I'm gonna get a Big Mac. What are you gonna first do? I'm gonna get a Big Mac. And they had heard this at the parole, at the uh, uh, Pardons Board. So when I got to the halfway house where they sent me to, the first day, I hadn't been there. I walked in the door, still had my bags, and the woman who was one of the supervisors there said, oh, you're the guy with the dog, the big dog, and uh, you want a Big Mac, I heard. I said, yes, ma'am, I do. She said, well, put your bags down, come on, get in the car. I said, what? 
put your bags down and come on, get in the car. I hadn't been there five minutes. We were out the door and went to McDonald's. And she ordered a Big Mac. I couldn't, I didn't know how to order. She's ordering by numbers and she's talking to a, a, a machine. And I'm saying, oh, I said, you order. And she did. And I got back to the place and unwrapped it. Now, for you, all those years before, I had seen the Big Mac on television where it was advertised to all beef patties. And that's what they were. They were huge, all beef, thick. I said, I have to get some. And when I unwrapped this and looked at it, I said, wow, this looks like the little crap that they substitute as meat <laughs> in the joint. I said, no, 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 it's, it's not. And I took a bite. I haven't eaten a Big Mac since. <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. What do you think is the key difference between the inmates that come out from that kind of like mental hole or mental struggle and want to discover and love and, and grow themselves versus those that end up being like, oh, the system got me here. I hate this. I hate that. And I mean, hate is a strong word. And, and like, just maybe be, maybe I don't kind is that, you know, shouldn't deserve to come out. Like what, what's the difference in the mindset and growth and spraying love okay, there? Can you put his question, simplify his question for me? Yo, he could write a book on this, so we're going to keep it short because we got a lot of questions. We, we're going to keep it short, but it's usually obvious. Humanity. Uh, I'm going to do that. Compassion. Empathy. All the things that we've learned that are on the plus side, not the minus side. On the minus side is viciousness. You know, selfishness, you know, uh, egotism, self-centeredness, and along with them, the ability and the need and the want and desire to hurt because they hurt quite often. Trauma informed, understanding what that means, which is why, again, I see the possibilities of growth for just about anybody because the majority of people that hurt have been hurt. The majority of people that harm have been harmed. And I have been in situations with brothers and others who have been deemed some of the worst of the worst, but with kindness, caring, understanding, empathy, with knowledge and education, with what you guys can learn through dialogue facilitation. Change is possible. It's obvious to see. And I've seen it time and time and time and time again. I was just hoping, beyond hope, that they'd be able to see that in me. And one day you, someone did. You know, if I could add something to this Lori has Lori has commonly uh, Lori's met you've Lori commonly says I have met holy men uh, in behind bars the, 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 some of the most holy most sacred uh, human beings behind bars including Mr. Hull is and Lori have a deep, deep spiritual relationship together, right back and forth, and have been writing back and forth for many, many years. And uh, is is a, is really a has now his masters in divinity, but is a holy man. This is guy. He was Irving was his mentor, which Irving is the one that got him on the path. Bro, you can stand maybe. Yeah. I've got two questions. So the first one: Do you believe that it's uh, just for a person to kill another person. Do you believe that it's just for a person? Is it ever just for a person to kill another person and to take then, another life? And then to continue on with his life, even though like the other person was killed and he doesn't get to, get to live his. 
And the second question, you said that punishment, I think, provides punishment or something like that. So I wanted to ask you, what do you think the point of punishment is? Okay. Yeah. The second question? The second one is, what's the point of punishment? Uh, the first one's complex, my friend. Uh, not, it doesn't have to be. All because right. it deals with the circumstance. Every circumstance can be slightly different. Some are the same. But it's according to the circumstance. So is it ever just to take a life? What if it was to save the life of your baby? You had to take that life. You know, what if it was, if it was accidental? What if it was unintended? I mean, we've already seen some scenarios where the taking of a life you know, it can be at least understood. Euthanasia for some, some, some couples, or some mothers with their children, or some men with their wives, or vice versa, where the pain of incapacitation just becomes too great. And I love this person so much, I can't stand another second of seeing her suffer. So, I put an extra dose of an opioid or something in their medicine and they peacefully transition. Is that justified? In his mind it is. Okay. And what's the second part? What's the second question? Is it ever, oh, punishment, what's the what's point? Ah, the, oh, the point of punishment. Dude, we have a lot of questions, so you got 30 seconds on this one. Punishment, I mean, first you'd have to define what punishment is, you know. Uh, hurting someone to avoid them hurting themselves or someone else? Is that punishment? Punishment when a parent disciplines their child. Not by abusing them. Mm -hmm. By punishment, uh, maybe taking away a favorite toy or food or standing in the corner. Or even me growing up, a belt on the, on the ass. Go ahead. Oh, stand. Okay, so um, I, first off, I want to say I really enjoyed your talk. And, um, Thank you. And there's something while I was like listening, um, there's something I was like really curious about. So I know earlier you said um, that like um, people, correct, correct me if I like did pra paraphrase sure. this like correctly, but you said something about like um, people shouldn't get punishment because people have like potential to change and grow, which I also like agree that people do have that potential. Mm -hmm. But you also say, said that during your experience, you've seen that people that deserves to be like in jail and you've seen like the greatest evil. So what would you say about like, like those people that you saw? Do you think that they like shouldn't get punishment because they have potential to grow? Or, or are they like the exceptions, if that makes sense? Good question. Now, I want to ask you, isn't being in prison punishment enough? I mean, when you're sent to prison, mm -hmm. they don't say, go to prison so you can be punished. It's, we're sending you to prison because you are being punished by being in prison and away from society. So, you have someone in prison who's not growing. We do everything that we can to accommodate that person and to aid and assist their growth and development until they can grow and we can deem them able to be returned to society. If they There's a, it, I said if. There's a question If that here. growth does not happen, if that growth does not happen, what else can we do? Yeah. 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 Oh, I want to go to a question. Did I answer here. your question? Yes, yes, yes. Thank oh. you. Go ahead. Go ahead, Lori. Wait, go, I know you, you also had your hand up first, and then we'll go here. Okay. Um, hi. I don't know if you remember. You probably don't. Um, I helped you at a store that I worked at downtown the summer of 2021. Uh, Fred needed water. I made sure um, they got water. You needed an orange Penn State shirt. I made sure you got that orange Penn State shirt. Of I just, course I remember. Really? <laughs> <laughs> of course. Was it on College Avenue? Yeah. It was a line of cup, yeah. <laughs> Not North Atherton, not South Atherton. Was it on College Avenue? Yep. Yes. 
Yeah, of I just course, wanted to of say. Of course, I remember yeah. you. You're one of those people. Like that's like, you're probably the only customer I remember from that job. Uh, you were just so kind, and you're just one of those people that stuck with me. Anyways. You hear that? <laughs> yeah. And they told me I should die in prison. <sighs> I just wanted to ask, um, what do you think? Like maybe like students like our age, what should we do if we like care about this issue of prison reform and all that stuff? Like what should we actively be doing right now? Be aware of what it is. A lot of people don't know what the criminal justice system is, how it impacts every life that's in here, or the prison industrial complex. Like Sam said, how they depend on prisons to make profit. You've all heard of Al Capone, Scarface, you know, uh, 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 Frank Nitti, uh, Buzz Moran, these notorious gangsters from 70, 80 years ago. Not one of them, not one, receives the amount of time that a young 18-year-old boy today receives for robbery for carrying a gun, but not necessarily hurting anyone. The laws have changed to such a degree that it's almost impossible for a person to go to jail for what's considered, or go to the penitentiary for what's considered a short time. Yeah. When I was first arrested, Wait. if you committed a homicide, or you killed somebody, and be it by accident, be it intentionally, be it in the course of a robbery, or be it both of you guys tussling and the guy falls and hits his head. First degree, you receive a life sentence. Second degree, you receive 10 to 20 years. Third degree, you got seven and a half to 15 years, max. Today, first degree is a life sentence. Second degree is a life sentence. Third degree is 20 years. And what happened that they up to penalties like that? They wanted to make sure that people stay in prison now. And, and That's the changes that have occurred. Another question I, wait, I asked wait. years ago. Wait a minute, Sam. I'm, I'm going to be brief. All right, okay, all right. I'm going to be right. brief. Years ago, I would have asked an audience this size, how many of you guys have been impacted by prisons or has someone in your family, family member who's been in prison, and a few hands would go up. If I asked today and says, how many of your fam either your family members, someone that you know, or someone in your neighborhood that you know has ever been impacted by prison, how many hands would go up? Let me see. A lot more than the old days, because prison impacts us all. And if you don't know someone or don't have anyone, remember, the budget for Pennsylvania DOC just for this year is $2.4 billion, and it's recession-proof and never goes down. So you're paying for it. A question here. Okay, so I'm only 19 years old, and I feel like I've been conditioned through the 19 years of living. So you being in prison for over 50 years, how have you, like, avoided being conditioned by imprisonment? Like, how have you now functioned in normalcy in a, in a normal way? Because you've been there for, like, you were in prison for Good a long time. Good question. Well, the first answer to that is, I read, I talked to people. I kept abreast of what was happening. Remember, it was different from when I first went in when there was no radio, no TV, no newspapers. Today, I can be in prison and know exactly what's going on everywhere. And I kept abreast of this. I asked questions. I talked to people. I often tell Sam and Laurie about growing up, having a, a condition, a speech impediment that got me into a lot of trouble. I stuttered horribly. I could not put two words together. Someone say something like, and I'm not doing this to make fun, but that's how I talk. So I couldn't talk. 
And people made fun of that. You know, that's what kids do. We're young and they're pointing and they're laughing at me and I don't know how to respond. So I get mad, I get angry. Well, I learned to speak as you would be doing once you enroll in what? World in conversation <laughs> as you're going to be doing. And I learned to listen. All right, so I, I have, so, hey, I, go ahead. I, I have to take the last question from the stream, okay? okay? So if you have a question for Irvin, we have two two and a half minutes left. So if you have a question for down. Irvin, talk to him after class. Listen, um, or stop by his house. He lives behind Wendy's over there on Indeed. University Drive. That's right. But listen. Stop um, in the neighborhood. Yo, but hang on a second. Hang on. Irvin, this is a question from the stream. Yes. Can in two minutes you say something about justice for victims and how do you see that like of how course, is that of course of course of course of the Yo, uh, hey, hang on hang on of the utmost importance justice for victims because they are people they have been impacted they have been harmed they are members of the community as we all are what restorative justice means is that we're going to find a, a way and a means of justice that impacts not only the perpetrator, and we're going to find him guilty and send him to prison, but we're going to find a way to ameliorate the amount of harm that he's done and find a way to make the community itself whole. Some kind of way that is, because what happens to the victims is of the utmost importance. What we're finding out today, I know two minutes, Sam, is that in so many families that have been victimized, those same families have what's been called or deemed a perpetrator also in that family. So many families that I've, I've grown up with have a person that's been murdered or robbed or raped and have a person in prison for robbery, murder, or rape. All in the same family. So six on one hand, half on half a dozen on the other. We can't take one with, without the other. What happens to the victims is of the utmost importance and we can't let them out of the equation. And I I just want to emphasize what Irvin just said about restorative justice, because I think it, when we talk about victims um, and offenders, this is in, in some way the only paradigm that actually accounts for offenders oh, yes. and victims. And, that the, and the belief and the work is that everybody has been harmed, everybody has a role to play in, in rebuilding and restoring after harm. So. I guess it's time to go. Thank you all.